Jim, everybody did great this morning. I uh, appreciate you participating in worship with us. Um, everybody looks like you survived the hurricane. We're all good. We're safe now. Um, those of you who didn't make it last week, we missed you for sure. Um, it was hey, it was a it was a low weekend. Obviously, um, you know a lot of people stayed at home. But just just in case you are ever wondering, maybe you didn't receive an email prior to last Sunday or see anything on social media um, about our schedule. Um, New Life is an always open kind of church. So you don't have to worry in inclement weather of any kind if you were to venture out and come on Sunday morning whether or not we will be here. I can guarantee you if it is possible for us to open these doors and have church, we're going to be here. So bar any kind of a uh, major catastrophe or something that would impede us from getting to the building or the power being out. If you feel like you can venture out and you feel safe doing so and you get here, we're going to be here. And um, that's just sort of the way we roll. That way you don't have to ask any questions. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to text me at 10 o'clock on Saturday night and ask, hey, we're we having church. The answer is yes. Every single time, yes. Um, so that is no obligation. Understand this. Because we always get flack for having that, that standard. There is no, just because we're open, you're not under any obligation to have to be here. Like, that's your choice. It's your own free will. But just know, if you do, you won't be by yourself. So um, just so you'll know, we're moving into the fall of the year. After that, winter and inclement weather comes with that. So just know as we go into uh, December, January, February, that kind of thing, if we have uh, any kind of bad weather that might would affect our schedule, we'll be here, all right? Um, another piece of good news that I want to share with our church this morning that I'm just super excited about. This past week, I received a call from our representative at URA Bank, and it pertained to, pertained to our um, uh, loan and the progress that we're making on It's All About Jesus campaign, the expansion and the bank has approved our loan, and so we're excited about that. That puts us one step closer, so things should start happening really, really quick. So, you know, we were praying, had our fingers crossed, all that good stuff over the past few weeks, just, just praying, Lord, that they would get that thing approved and everything would be green-lighted. So it's done. It's a done deal. And so they said they'll be calling us over the next few weeks, probably a couple times each week, getting information um, to help them along in the process to get the loan written up and everything like that. So we are moving along at a pretty good clip. So uh, here in the very near future, I would say within the next month or so, we should actually start seeing uh, some things happening here on, uh, on our grounds. And so as uh, long as nothing holds us up. But just keep that in mind. Keep praying about the project. Keep praying for our church. And, and this will be a good time to, to remind you um, if you have pledged to give, then make sure you're doing that, you're fulfilling your pledge, but also make sure that you're marking it in a way that we can track it. Either put it in an envelope and mark that with the uh, pledge commitment or write it on it. If you're giving by check, write it on your check that you are designating this portion above and beyond your tithe, whatever, uh, toward it's all about Jesus. Or if you do online, that's one of the easiest ways. Just go online and click give and set up a recurring gift. Every month, every week, however uh, you want to do that. So that would be sort of the, the easiest way. And then you don't have to think about it um, every week or two weeks or every month. But thank you for all of those who have given and been so faithful to that. We appreciate it. Um, this morning, to get us thinking in the right direction of where we're going to be going over the next few weeks, I just want to ask this question. Because I do it all the time. But do you ever find yourself... Maybe you're watching the news or you see a report, if, if anybody actually reads the newspaper anymore, but you see it, it's, it's still in the boxes. You know, they still sell those in the little metal boxes, but you go by and you look at Do you ever find yourself just like in utter astonishment at the evil, the vileness that's going on in, in our world? You ever just sort of, I know you think, well, after whatever it was, the last thing that was the worst thing you'd ever heard, after that you think, well, nothing will surprise me now. Well, it can't get much worse than that. And then the next week you see something, or you hear about something, you read something, 
And you find yourself just totally surprised. It's like, man, where is this world going? Like, what is happening? And I'm not talking about just in the United States. I'm talking about worldwide. At the evil, the violence, the wickedness of people. You know, you find yourself being a little bit apprehensive, uh, a little worried, a little, even a little fearful at where the world's going. And then if you add on top of that, what seems to be, and you know, now I'm no meteorologist or anything like that, but what seems to be an ever-increasing number and severity of natural disasters, I mean, maybe it's not that it's happening more often. Maybe we just hear about it more often. But things seem to be spiraling downward fairly quickly and consistently. I mean, if you just think back over what is now close to the, the last 20 years, at some of the things that's gone on and some of the things that we as a world and even as a country have had to experience, it, it'll blow your mind when you think about year after year after year certain things happen. If you just go back and, and use as a starting point one of the largest and worst terrorist attacks on U.S. soil, 2000. And one, September 11th, if you just used that as a starting point and then moved forward in time, I mean, let me remind you of some of the things that's happened over the last 20 years. After the attacks in 2001, the very next year in 2002, if you'll remember, that was when we were all uh, watching the TV closely because the main story was the D.C. sniper attacks. You remember that? These two guys that were shooting people at random, whether it be you know, at a mall or a gas station or out along the highway. The next year, 2003, the Iraq war began. We began hearing news about um, you know, massive genocide in Sudan. 2004, uh, a huge tsunami in the Indian Ocean killed over 200,000 people. 2005, Hurricane Katrina most of us remember when that hit, even you know, we, if we weren't in that area and necessarily affected by Hurricane Katrina directly, all of us remember it. I was on the ground about three to four weeks after the hurricane came through, and I'm going to tell you, I was in Gulfport, Mississippi, did work in Gulfport in Biloxi, Louisiana, and it looked like a war zone for blocks from the beach blocks back, four, five, six blocks back, everything was leveled. Everything wiped out. It, it was one of the worst sights I'd ever seen in my life, and I'll never forget it. 2007, we remember hearing about the Virginia Tech shootings, one of the deadliest shootings in U.S. history. 2008, global financial crisis, 2009, the shooting at Fort Hood, 2010, you had an earthquake in Haiti that killed over 300,000 people, 2011, another earthquake and a tsunami in Japan that created a nuclear crisis, and we could just go on and on and on and on up until present day, just this year. Just think about the number of school shootings, wildfires, floods, hurricanes, terrorist attacks around the world. I mean, what's going on here? What is happening in our world? And then, you know, like to top it off, you got this little pinhead in the pinhead part of, a, of the world called Little Rocket Man, right? And who knows what he's thinking? Who knows what he's concocting? Like, where is our world going? What are we headed toward it. And you think, where does, all, where does all this evil and this violence, where does it come from? How did we get here? Well, simply it's a result of existing in a fallen world, a sin-filled world. But more specifically, it comes from the devil, from Satan himself, who Jesus said is out to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible describes him in 2 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, as the God, the little g, God of this world. And as the God of this world, He has some authority. He has some say-so. 
he has somewhat some free reign to do as he wills. And that's exactly what he wants to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. To create chaos and to wreak havoc in our world. And you might think, well, why? Well, simply because he's a hater of God. And everything that pertains to God. That's why he's out to, to kill and destroy you and me. Because we were created in the image of God. And so Satan is a hater of man. Now to answer the question, where's all this going? Where is it leading us to? Quite frankly, the end. The end of our world and existence as we know it. Now I don't say that to like, scare you to death. Or to strike necessarily, strike the fear of God in you in any way. I actually say it in hopes that I can give you some encouragement. To build you up and, and to give you hope about the future. Because let me remind you that the devil, though he has some authority, and though he has the ability to carry out his will to a certain extent, he's on a short leash. He's on a short leash. There's only so much chaos, there's only so much havoc that He can cause in our world because there's a day that is coming when Jesus Christ will put an end to Satan's reign of terror in this world. He will be brought to justice. Evil will be brought to an end. You see, Satan was defeated on the cross. But there is coming a day, the Bible is pointing toward a time in the future... When Jesus will return, not as a baby in a manger, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah, when he will return as a conqueror, when he will return as the rider on a white horse with all of the armies of heaven following him, and he will put Satan in his place, his final place of defeat, and will destroy all of those who oppose God and his plan. And now you might wonder, well, where would I go if I wanted a little more information about what you're talking about? About these final events and, and the end time events? Well, you go to the last book in your Bible called the book of Revelation. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to spend some time in this uh, interesting, fascinating book of the Bible, one that I think... Um, we have avoided, to be quite honestly, we have avoided far too long to our own detriment. And so we're going to be exploring this book over the next uh, several weeks. And I know for some of you who are really interested in the book of Revelation, like you're so excited right now. You know, you're, you can hardly contain your schoolgirl giddiness. He's like, the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know, I wonder what the pastor is going to say about when the rapture's taking place, or you know, what are the seven plagues and the you know the ten this and the seven that and you know horns and crowns and you're thinking six six six, what does that mean? And then I Christ, who's the beast? You know, all these questions are just running through your mind. It, I hate to do it, but I might as well do it now than later. But I hate to disappoint you. That's not the kind of series this is going to be. I really don't want to let you down, but I just have to. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is because I'm not John Hagee. Now, if you don't know who John Hagee is, just Google him after the service. Now, granted, hey, he is deserving of his respect. And whether you actually agree with his position on the book of Revelation or not, um, I believe he is a brilliant mind, and he is one of the premier leading teachers on the book of Revelation. So I'm not him. I'm not going to go into that kind of detail. But even if I wanted to, seven weeks, it'd just be absolutely impossible to do. We could not give the details of the book of Revelation any uh, attention that they deserve in this amount of time. And so we're just going to do somewhat of an overview. And so I, I think that's probably best, because let's just be honest here. If I could have a raise of hands right now for everyone in here who would be willing to say, not only have I read the book of Revelation, but I have studied it and I believe I have a good grasp on its message and interpretation. Give me those hands. All right, I got a few of them. 
The majority of us aren't so confident, are we? We're, we're somewhat intimidated by this book. And, and we're a little unsure about its meaning. And so that's why I think we need to take a step back. Instead of getting bogged down into all the details and the, very, uh, the various uh, interpretations and, and approaches and views to this particular book, just step back. Let's get sort of a 30,000 foot view of the book of Revelation so that we can all then have the confidence to move in and wade in a little deeper, right? Let's not just jump off into the deep end. Let's, let's wade in over the next several weeks. And I think that's probably, for us, going to be the better approach. And so to get us started with that, I just simply want to answer one question today about the book of Revelation. What is it? That's it. What is the book of Revelation? If I were going to answer that question from simply a literary perspective... I would begin to explain it like this. The book of Revelation is the last book of a collection of books that we know as the Bible. It was written by the Apostle John during his exile on the Isle of Patmos around A.D. 95. It was written to the first century church concerning future events. It would be categorized as apocalyptic literature because of its use of symbolism and its description of future events. However, that kind of definition and explanation really doesn't answer for us what is, at its core, what is the book of Revelation. In other words, if we were to go and read it today, maybe for the very first time, in its entirety, what should we expect to see? What should we expect to read to encounter, what would it sound like? What, what kind of images would come to our mind? and What would we take away from it? That answers the question, what is the book of Revelation? And, and I just want to say, before we get too far into it, before any of you ever read it, and before we do any kind of study of it, the book of Revelation is a special book. And that's not to say that that all the books of the Bible are not special. They are. But it is special in its own right because the book of Revelation has certain characteristics about it that make it special that we need to be aware of, that we need to acknowledge before we go diving in. And I think it will help us understand it a little bit. Now, this entire series, as we study through and, and talk through uh, this fascinating book, I'm going to be using personally as a resource tool and as a guide, a commentary on Revelation by Warren Wiersbe. It's called Be Victorious. If you'd like to pick that up, you can get it in, in Lifeway. You can order it on Amazon. It's already, over the past uh, four or five weeks, been a great resource for me personally, reading through uh, the book of Revelation and receiving uh, commentary and the comments and the explanations and stuff. But in this particular uh, commentary, he talks about some of these characteristics of this book that are helpful to be aware of and to understand before you start doing a study. And so I wanted to share those with you this morning. There's nine characteristics that we want to point out about the book of Revelation. And the first one is that it is a Christ-centered book. And now, again, that's not to say that all of Scripture and the other books of the Bible are not Christ-centered. They most certainly are. The entire Bible is about one person, Jesus. But Revelation, in a very unique way, from the beginning to its very conclusion, maintains its focus on the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. And we can see that right out of the gate in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, that reveals to us a complete title. Because most of us, if we would refer to the last book of the Bible, we would just say Revelation or the book of Revelation. But John reveals in Revelation 1.1 that that is an incomplete title. He says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the book. That is the vision. 
that John received. He's saying, what I am writing and what I have been given, what I have received is a revelation not of future events, not of catastrophic judgment, not even of God's eternal kingdom, though all of those things are included. As a whole, what, I'm received, what I've received and what I'm giving you is a revelation of someone, not something. Of a person, not a place. And that person is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a Christ-centered book. With that in mind, number two, it is an open book. Now let's not make things really complicated here. I, I like to ke- keep things simple. What is the opposite of open? Closed. Man, you guys are on it this morning. On your game. You missed last week, but you came bringing it all this week. All right. The opposite of open is closed. Let's think about that for a second. What does it mean for something to be either opened or closed? If something is open, if we're talking about an open, we open a door, we open a window, we open a book, or we open a sealed container, or tomorrow morning you go to the office and you open an email. To open something means that you are gaining or you have been given access to something. Right? Now, to close is the opposite of that. If we close a door, we close a book, we close a container, you close a door because you want to restrict access to whatever is on the other side. Or maybe you want to conceal something. Hey, your kid's bedroom is a mess. Close the door. Conceal it. Nobody has to see it, right? Well, the book of Revelation begins with a statement that tells us this is an open book. This is a book that is meant to reveal something. In other words, God is giving us, because it's a revelation of Jesus, God is giving us access to Jesus Christ and His message as it pertains to future events. The very word revelation means to reveal or unveil. The Greek word for it is the word that we get our English word apocalypse from. Now, unfortunately today, the word apocalypse has become synonymous with catastrophe, chaos, doom, Armageddon, you know, the whole world's coming to an end, you know, molten lava falling from the sky. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the image when you hear the word apocalypse. But that's not the actual meaning of the word. The word apocalypse is a word that describes openness, and it literally means to uncover, to unveil or to make known. So Revelation is a book, an apocalyptic book, that is meant to unveil something. In other words, God is pulling back the curtain and allowing us to see Jesus Christ and His plan for the future. That's what this book is. It's not being hidden as it was in the past. It's not being concealed. God is opening this up and giving us access. One of the books, if you find yourself reading and studying through the book of Revelation, one of the books in the Old Testament, you're using resources and things like that, that you'll find yourself going back to is the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel is also a highly prophetic book. And Daniel received messages and visions about future events, not only of his day, but of eschological days, the the end of time. But here's what Daniel was told about what he saw, the revelations he was given. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Daniel, I want you to close this, to restrict access. Now compare that to what John was told in Revelation 22 verse 10 as he received his message and his vision. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. One was closed, one was hidden and concealed. The other, the book of Revelation, was told, don't conceal it. 
Don't cover it up. Don't close it. Because this is an open book with an open message. See, contrary to what some people believe and other people want to suggest, the book of Revelation is not some closed secret book of codes that only a few people can understand. Nothing could be further from the truth. The book of Revelation is a very open book with a message from God to His people that He wants us to read, He wants us to hear, and He wants us to understand. You see, that's where some of us find it difficult. Oh, I can read it, and I can listen to somebody talk about it, but I have trouble understanding. Why? Well, one of the reasons that we have difficulty understanding it is because the, the third characteristic here is that Revelation is a symbolic book. I'm not suggesting that everything in the book of Revelation is symbolic. I'm just saying that it contains a lot of symbolism. Just one example here. The word Babylon is used quite a bit in the book of Revelation. And at first glance, you would think it's referring to the ancient city of Babylon. But keep in mind, if the book of Revelation... It's talking primarily about future events. Well, you should know then that Babylon was conquered by the Persians and ceased to exist over 2,500 years ago. So how can a book with a message about the future be referring literally to a civilization that ceased to exist over 2,000 years ago? That just doesn't make sense. So Babylon, as you get to uh, Revelation 17 and 18, has to be referring to something in a symbolic way. I would suggest to you that Babylon is referring uh, to a godless society, an apostate church, a corrupt political system. Hey, listen, all of those, we can see like we're headed straight for it. That could be today. And none of us would be surprised, right? So the question then is, well, why does God reveal his message to John? And why does John write it using so much symbolism? Well, people suggest a few reasons for that. One is they say, well, maybe John used all of this symbolism because as you study it, much of the symbolism in the book of Revelation ties back to something in the Old Testament. So keep in mind that John, being persecuted for his faith, being exiled, is writing a message to the first century Christian church, many of whom are converted Jewish believers, have a wide knowledge, a deep knowledge of the Old Testament, and he's using symbolism as a way to throw off the Roman authorities. Maybe they get a hold of his writings and they want to try to use his writings as evidence against the Christian church as if they're going to come against Rome and try to overthrow uh, the Roman government. And so to avoid any of that, he confuses them and puzzles them with all this symbolism. Symbolism that your average first century Christian Jewish reader would have picked up on immediately and understood easily. All right, so that's, that's one possibility. Another possibility is for the simple fact that symbolism is not weakened by time. And now I'm talking outside of the book of Revelation. Writers use symbolism all the time because you, know, you can draw a picture with your words and that picture will be just as vibrant today as it will be in 20, 30, 40, 50, 1,000 years from now. So symbols aren't weakened by time. Another reason is that symbolism does more than communicate a message. Symbolism doesn't just convey information. Symbolism invokes emotion. You see, the reason writers use symbols and descriptions is because they not only want you to understand a message or to receive information, they want you to feel something. And so, for example, John, if he was talking about a time in the future, could have simply said something like, there is coming a day sometime in the future 
when an evil dictator who claims to be God will rule the world. That is the basic information. But it's sort of dry, isn't it? It doesn't make you feel anything. So instead of saying it that way, in a very literal way, he used symbolism. And he refers to this person as a beast. In Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, John says, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. Now, hold on. Those of you who are just really excited about Revelation, I know you're thinking, what are the horns and what are the heads? And tell me those names. i got to know it. You want me to explain the symbolism. But you see, there, there's danger in getting too far ahead of ourselves and getting so caught up with every little detail. Because he, here's the thing. Whether you're in the book of Revelation, the book of Psalms, the book of Daniel, any book of the Bible that uses any kind of figurative language, even the parables of Jesus, if you're not careful in uh, interpreting symbolism, you're going to misinterpret the Scripture. Because when you go to derive a meaning of some symbol or some figurative language, if it deviates from the teaching of the Scripture as a whole, then guess what's wrong? Your interpretation. You've missed the mark. So we have to read the book of Revelation and understand it through the lens of Scripture as a whole so that we don't get off base. Number four, and this is probably one of the characteristics um, and a, and a reason why so many people are so intrigued and fascinated with this book is the book of Revelation is a prophetic book. It's a prophetic book. Yeah, it's Christ-centered. It's highly symbolic. It's open. But what really interests us is that it's prophetic. It's talking about the future, about some time that we have not yet arrived at. We've not yet visited. We know nothing about. In the very last chapter, chapter 22, verse 7, Jesus says this about uh, what he has delivered to John. He says, look, I am coming soon, and blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy written in this scroll. Jesus himself calls this information that we find in this very last book of the Bible prophetic. Something else that's interesting about this book is that, to my knowledge, it's the only book of the Bible that provides its own table of contents. It gives itself its own outline. This is what you are to expect as you read through this prophecy. And it's set up in sort of a past, present, and future kind of structure. In chapter 1, verse 19, as, God, as John begins to receive this vision... He is told, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. And the funny thing is, is as you read, you find that exact structure throughout the entire book. A past, present, and future structure. Chapter 1 is what you have seen, or what has been. Chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, and we're going to get to those here in just a few weeks. Chapters 2 and 3 are, for John, what is now? And as we uh, sort of read into those letters, even for us, it can be what is now. Once you enter chapter 4 through the rest of the book, chapter 22, that is what will take place. And focuses primarily on future events. And it's the only prophetic book in the New Testament. That's what makes it so special. It serves and stands alone in the New Testament as a reminder that the same Jesus who lived and reigned from eternity past, who came into this world in the flesh, born of a virgin, crucified, buried, and rose from the dead, that same Jesus is the one who will rule and reign in eternity future. That's the message of the book of Revelation. I don't care how you uh, look at the symbolism 
I don't care what approach you take to uh, interpreting the meaning of this book. The message of the book of Revelation is that Jesus Christ has and always will rule and reign forever. That's it. Don't miss that meaning. Another characteristic, and this is one that is just absolutely, um, it, it blows my mind as to why we don't spend more time in this book. Because number five, the book of Revelation is an endowing book. In other words, it's a book, simply, that will bless you. Now, I believe there, is, there are plenty of blessings to be received by, by reading all of Scripture. But the book of Revelation actually states, if you read me, you will be blessed. How much more plain could it be, right? And so why is it that we avoid it so much? I, I talk to to followers of Christ, and I've talked to you know, people in the church about the book of Revelation, and many times what I get in return is, well, I've never really read it because I don't understand it. And sometimes I'll get even this. I don't read the book of Revelation because it scares me, because I'm afraid to. Listen, I think both of those excuses, and that's what they are, both of those excuses are lies that we've been fed by Satan because he wants to keep us in the dark concerning the promise that God has made in the very first chapter in the third verse of the book. John wrote in Revelation 1 and verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. He's recording the very words of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you are blessed if you will read this. And blessed are those who hear it and take heart to what is written in it because the time is near. I mean, if there was anything you could do to guarantee that you knew all I had to do was this and God would bless me, would you do it? Of course you would. Well, he just said, if you will read, listen to, in other words, listen to other people talk about or read this book, and take to heart what it says, you'll be blessed. He said it twice in one verse. So why aren't we doing it? It's a book that will bless us. And church, we're missing out on the blessing. So it's time to shed this, this fear and intimidation about something that God has opened up before us and said, here it is. You will be better off having partook of this. All right? Number six, it's a relevant book. Not irrelevant, relevant book. Listen, there are so many different approaches. So many ways that people uh, interpret the message and the meaning of the book of Revelation. I'll just be honest with you. It'll make your eyes cross. It, it, you sit down and you read these different points of view, and it'll make you want to pull out your hair. And it seems like you can't get any two differing opinions in the same room to agree on anything. And so for your average reader like you and me, your average student of the Bible, it would cause us to sit back and wonder, well, is it even worth reading? Does it have any value, any meaning, any relevance for me today, right now? And now let me play devil's advocate here for a second and actually use some of John's own words against him. If you sit down and you read the book of Revelation, you get to verse 1. All right, really making some headway here. All right, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. What must soon take place? Now let me remind you, John wrote this over 2,000 years ago. If it must soon take place when he wrote it, does it really have any relevance for us now after so many years? Well, here's where we need to understand that, that soon doesn't mean immediate. Immediate. That's how we see it. That's how we define it. But soon does not mean immediate. 
And one reason for that is because God doesn't operate on our time schedule. He doesn't even exist within the boundaries of our, what we know as time. He created that and He is sovereign over it. You ever heard the scripture referred to that says, To God, a thousand years is as one day, and one day is as a thousand years? You heard that? Well, why is that true? Well, because again, God does not operate on our schedule. He has his own timetable, and he's going to do things when he's good and ready to do it. So, so that's one reason. But also because, again, soon doesn't mean immediate. Soon means quickly. Soon means suddenly. You do a study of the Word, and that's exactly what John is saying here. God gave this to John to show his servants what must suddenly or quickly take place. In other words, the message of Revelation is this. The things that will uh, happen, that are prophesied to happen in this book, when they begin, they will begin quickly. They will take place suddenly. It's pointing us to that day when Jesus Christ will return, and it's saying, get your affairs in order today. Don't waste time. The book of Revelation has a message of preparedness, of readiness, because Jesus is coming. And when He does, He will come quickly. He will come suddenly. So be ready. You see, that fact alone makes everything contained in the book of Revelation extremely relevant. Because Jesus has yet to return. Every single day could be that day. Number seven is that the book of Revelation is a majestic book. I'm going to go into this in a lot greater detail here in just a few weeks as we uh, walk through chapters 4 and 5. But Revelation has been called the book of the throne. If you were to sit down and read and mark every time the word throne occurs in its 22 chapters, you will find that it occurs no less than 46 times. You see, there is a focus on the throne of God, especially in chapters 4 and 5. Uh, that particular week, I'm going to preach a message called, What in Heaven Will We Do and What on Earth is Happening? We're going to sort of get a split-screen look at what's happening simultaneously. simultaneously. What's going on in Heaven, and while that's happening, what's going on here in earth, so, on Earth? So just so you know, that week, we're going to cover a lot of the book of Revelation. Now, we're just going to take off a whole big chunk of it. But when we look at what's going on in heaven, it is all centered around the throne of God. The throne of the Lord Jesus Christ is the focal point. The book of Revelation magnifies the majesty, the sovereignty, the glory, the power, the honor of Jesus and none other. Number eight. It's a universal book. You see, there was a fallacy in the mindset of the Jewish people that Jesus fought against, the other apostles, the apostle Paul, that they took up arms against. You can see this mindset all throughout the Old Testament. The mindset was that God, Jehovah, Yahweh, was the Jewish God. He's ours, and he, he belongs to nobody else. So all of you Gentiles, and that would pretty much be all of us, you're on your own. You're out of luck. Get your own God. This one's ours. You can't have him, right? Jesus came against that. The prophets even came against that. The apostles, Paul, came against that. And here in the book of Revelation, John attacks that mindset and he reveals to us in chapter 7, verse 9, he says, gives us a, a glimpse into heaven. Just by the way, next week, don't miss James Jacob. All right? Yes, he's going to talk a little bit about what's going on in India, but I've asked him to speak uh, specifically on a topic pertaining to the book of Revelation. So next week, James is going to describe for us, and he's going to talk to us in detail about this place called heaven. And he's going to trace the descriptions of heaven 
not just in the book of Revelation, but all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So pack a lunch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said he would do it quickly, all right? But anyway, uh, when John gets a glimpse into heaven, in chapter 7, verse 9, look at what he says. He says, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, an innumerable amount of people. He says, from every tribe, every nation, every people and language standing before the throne and for, before the Lamb. Well, if God is only the God of the Jews, then we need to take that particular scripture out of the Bible because it's not true. I don't think we're going to do that because what John saw was reality in heaven. There will be people from every corner of the earth because the message of Revelation, and I believe throughout the entire Bible, is that God is not only the God overall, but He's the God of all. And He is the God who accepts anyone, no matter their tribe, no matter their nation, no matter their skin color, no matter their background, He accepts anyone who will come to Him in faith through Jesus Christ. And so we see that message in the book of Revelation. And then the last one here is that the book of Revelation is a climactic book. Um, when I was taught in school how to write a story, and I can remember this even in, in Bible college when they were teaching us how to construct and write a sermon, I was always told that there's a particular structure, a method to writing a good story. You obviously have a beginning or an introduction where you gain people's interest. Right? That's sort of the bait. And then you, once you have people sort of on the hook and interested in what you have to say or what you have uh, written, you deliver the body of the message or the story. That's most of your content. But as you deliver and you write or speak the body of the message, you're taking them sort of up the mountain, so to speak, to a climactic point where, where you're going to make your statement, you're going to make your case, sort of plant that flag, and then you're going to take them back down the other side of the mountain and land it. It's sort of like a roller coaster or a plane ride. You know, you, you take off, and then you land it. And that's sort of the way every good story reads. And for the most part, when I'm preparing a sermon, I think in terms like that. I, I want to get people's attention. I want to deliver a message, I want to make a strong point, and then I want to close things out under an hour. Right? And, and you're hoping for that too. And while that is the way most people write, and that is the good, a good structure, that's really not how the Bible's written. If you step back and think about it, now there are a lot of climactic events throughout the Bible. There are a lot of major things going on. I mean... You think about the incarnation of Christ when God came in the flesh as a baby in the manger. That's a pretty big deal. And then 33 and a half years later, when he gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross and rose from the dead, that too is a pretty big deal. That's a climactic event. However, the highest pinnacle, the greatest of all events throughout the entire Bible seems to be reserved for the very end, when in keeping with His sovereignty, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, when He comes to complete and fulfill all that He had set in motion way back here in the beginning. That's the book of Revelation. And my hopes is that not only have I sort of sparked your interest, but I've got you wanting to go home and, and to begin to read this book. I'm not asking you to interpret its meaning, to explain its symbolism, to tell me what the ten horns and seven heads are next Sunday. I'm not asking for any of that. My hopes is that you will go home and read it and be blessed.
in your notes, if, uh, if you're using the Bible app, if you use that on your phone or on your tablet, you can download, it's a free version Bible app, and follow us in the events section. If you're using that, today and every single Sunday following throughout this series, you'll find at the bottom there, there is a 25-day reading plan through the book of Revelation. Start there. If you've never read through the book of Re- Revelation, start there. And begin this journey with us. Another step that you can take over the next seven weeks, if you would like to talk more and hear more about this incredible book, our life groups will be talking about every single message that I or anyone else preaches through this entire series. Our life groups will be uh, given notes, will be given talking points, questions, and and discussion uh, methods about the book of Revelation. So get involved in a life group. Uh, right now happens to be open, what we call open season for our life groups. And so what that means is if there's a group who wants to discuss maybe something else or go through a particular book study of some sort, they have the, the privilege to do that. We don't, I don't know of any that are actually doing that right now, so everybody's getting sermon-based uh, notes. Um, but even if one of those happens to be the case, If you're available, I will be leading um, a group on Wednesday night. I I do anyway, but I'll be leading a group on Wednesday night right here at the church. And so if that best fits your schedule, to come out on Wednesday night at 7, we're going to be talking about the book of Revelation and and try to go into a little more detail. It's probably still not going to be John Hagish, but uh, you know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, to each his own, and, and he is in a world of his own when it comes to his knowledge on that. But... Um, I'll do my best, and we'll go through this together, and I'll just be honest with you. Hey, we'll wrestle with it. We'll struggle with it together, and I think we'll learn that way. So we'll meet here on Wednesday night at at 7, and I think that could really be uh, beneficial for you. But right now, let's just make a commitment to start somewhere. To not allow any kind of fear, lack of understanding, or intimidation about the book of Revelation to keep us from a promised blessing of God a day longer, all right? With every head bowed and every eye closed, God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word today. Your word is truth. And God, we believe what you said here, that the book of Revelation is a book that will bless us. As you unveil the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, and you begin to reassure us about what must soon, quickly, and swiftly take place. And I believe if we will start this journey and we will read through this this fantastic and, and awesome book that you have given us, then at the end, we will echo the words of Jesus Christ himself and say, Come, Lord Jesus. Come soon. It's in your name we pray today. Amen. Would you stand with us?